Hello friends, I'm glad to welcome you to the Captain German channel and today we have a technical and very important episode. I'm standing next to solar panels for a reason, because today we will be discussing the boat's electrical system, energy consumption, how to manage this energy and how to make the boat independent. A big release, very comprehensive, and I hope this episode will be very useful for yachtsmen. So you're all updated, subscribe to the channel, like and hit the bell. You can write comments during the process. It will be interesting to chat if there's something I don't know. Feedback is always useful and always welcome. Write comments, we read them all. All right, friends, let's go. We're sitting down at the computer now and starting to dive into the details of what's happening. Our video will be divided into two parts. The first part will cover the principles and rules of computer use. How to figure out what to do, how to calculate. And secondly, I'll basically show you how to assemble the Vectron system, which I have, and show the basic settings and monitoring what it can do. Two fundamental approaches in yachting. The first is when we save electricity. This means we minimize everything, don't use power, and have a wind van installed. And uh, we live on the most economical batteries. Well, you get it. We will not consider this option because we want to live in a different way. Imagine you're used to living in an urban environment, you live in the city, and you use a range of electronic devices, electrical appliances such as a dishwasher or a washing machine. There's a coffee maker and so on. So when moving to a boat, I don't want to give up my habits. Why? I want to live the life I'm used to and in addition enhance it. It's about the ability to move, but all my usual computers, gadgets, devices, internet. I want to have my own on the boat, just like at home, like in an apartment. I don't want to worry about having limited time, electricity. I can't afford to turn on the washing machine or that we won't take a shower because we've run out of water and there's nowhere to get it. So I am absolutely against such an approach and we will be looking at how to make life as familiar as it was. And I hope you will like it and not set any limits. So let's look at what we have in terms of consumers because we will be matching it to the energy received. For the amount of energy consumed by our boat, all the calculations I do will be uploaded in Excel. There will be a file in the description. You can download it, enter your data, your consumption, and calculate it. I will also provide you with a link to a calculator that calculates watts and amps. Because previously in the video, I showed you how we calculate the load on the boat. That's uh, absolutely correct. In yachting, calculations are done this way, but we're talking about a 12 volt system. When we switch to high voltage networks, like 220, everything is measured in watts. This makes it a bit complicated to calculate. That's why the table will include watts and amperes. Let's go over how to use the electricity table. So in the left column, we have the energy consumers. Comment, this will describe what I mean in this row. Next, watts per cycle, that is, how many watts are consumed in an hour or per device cycle. In this case, we consider one hour of our boat's operation. Watts per day, we need to understand the total daily energy consumption. Energy, because over a day, we will somehow get it back. And amps, as I mentioned, the 12 volt systems measure the load in amps because there is a tool that shows directly on the screen how many amps are flowing through your system. So we must calculate in amps. The first five positions indicate how much 
the boat consumes in standby mode. That is, roughly speaking, one refrigerator or two refrigerators, how many people are on the boat, two people flushing the toilets or four, two people using water in the shower or four, essentially four, well, in general, four more people. You need to charge more phones and so on. So the first five, this, uh, this pertains solely to the boat and its operations. We don't include water makers or anything else here, just the boat in its own mode. The first is economic emergencies, where everything is turned off, but the water is working, the refrigerator is working, toilets are functioning, so everything is operational. In this case, our boat consumes eight amperes. If we are in autopilot mode and have the instruments running in this mode, we estimate 15 amperes, which is the network load indicating how much your uh, boat will consume per hour if additional devices are used. Boat regular is the normal consumption. In the scenario where you are simply living on it, your Bluetooth is working. Water, one fridge. So it's a regular mode. Regular plus is when you have two fridges running, additional people come over and naturally your boat's energy consumption increases significantly. The load significantly increases because just one refrigerator consumes five or six amperes more. So roughly speaking, we greatly increase energy consumption even by just turning on the refrigerator in standby mode and bought full power is when onboard maximum load is when there are rough sea conditions with waves, the autopilot is steering and trying to manage. When all devices are operating, lights are on and navigation lights are active. In this case, it can be and 30 amperes, meaning this will likely be rare or episodic, but we include it because it is necessary for calculations. So the first five positions, this is what the boat consumes depending on how many people are on board and which devices are turned on, specifically on the 12 volt onboard network from the equipment installed on the boat. Now, let's see what we have regarding consumers. First, the washing machine. We, we run it about uh, two times a week, mainly for general bedding and some personal clothes like t-shirts and underwear. So let me now, here I'm giving an example. We won't cover everything, just uh, some key points. So we use the washing machine twice a week, which means we'll consume three kilowatts for the week. Roughly speaking, dividing this three kilowatts by seven days, we get 429 watts that we need per day. Receive if we have two washes per week. For the dishwasher, I calculated two cycles per day. The water maker, we calculate it like this. We estimate 50 to 60 liters per day. If we don't use it, that's a bonus. If we, for example, use it for laundry, that's two times 60 liters. So roughly speaking, the, uh, for each wash, we add one hour of water maker operation. The Starlink internet runs 24 hours. It seems like a small thing, but it consumes 1.2 kilowatts per day. That's a significant amount of energy that needs to be sourced from somewhere. You can use it 24 hours uh, a day or turn it off at night. I've outlined these two options here. You see, you will see how everything is arranged here. Use the computer. The computer consumes 40 watts. If there are two people, that's two computers, resulting in 80 watts of consumption. If we multiply them by a five-hour workday, it's not always two working, sometimes less. But anyway, we will end up adding 400 watts per day for the computer. And one kilowatt for all the peripherals. If you, I don't know, are blogging, you have cameras, phones, tablets, some FPV drones, regular drones, basically a bunch of devices that need charging. For all of these, we allocate one kilowatt. If there are two people living on the boat, below we have six positions that differ in energy consumption. The most important thing is the wattage per day. So 
We need to understand that regular consumption is what we consume regularly and regular for regular. Full power consumption means when everything is turned on. The two main positions are regular, which is regular consumption, and regular plus, which is when we are within this range. But we need to understand that if we consume a bit more, we will need to save energy somewhere. If we run short on energy, we can choose not to run the dishwasher to conserve power. It's like this is the range in the plus. If, for instance, everything is okay and the second fridge is off, we can use the dishwasher. So we can adjust these ranges for ourselves. But we need to understand how much energy we will have for this working range. Had energy replenishment. So regarding electrical energy consumption, regarding consumption, we understand, but we will just leave this tab for now and move on to the next one because we will be calculating consumption and energy acquisition. So let's go to the solar panels. You can see on the top left side, we have all the same items highlighted in red, indicating our regular consumption. We economize a bit and reduce usage, for example, if we have two refrigerators. So in the table, we have amps, watts per hour, and then how much we need to receive per hour from the solar panels is very important. We estimate the solar panels at 60% efficiency. This is the amount of energy we can obtain from the panels because when the sun is shining, some panels might be in the shade and some might not perform optimally. Some panels, I mean, work poorly because they are already old. Some panels, perhaps not angled correctly towards the sun, work poorly. Therefore, we consider the panel's efficiency at 60%. So we take 60% as the amount we can actually draw from the battery. This means we need to add another 40% to these figures to determine the battery capacity. And importantly, we estimate that we can receive energy from the sun from 10 in the morning to 4 in the morning. These six hours are the period during which we can collect energy. If your timing differs, which I doubt, you enter your data into the table and get some of your numbers. In our case, that's how it is. Well, maybe it starts working from nine if everything is fine, but it will still be inefficient. That's why we consider starting from 10. If it does work from nine, it means there is a power reserve and we may get more. We might boil more water or turn on the water heater, anything like that. We end up with three main modes and the regular mode is highlighted in red. That means we take uh, our boat's uh, hourly consumption, add 40%, and we need to get 1,875 watts per hour if we're talking from 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. If we economize a bit, one and a half kilowatts of panels is enough. If we conserve less, then it is two and a half meaning roughly from one and a half to two and a half kilowatts of solar panels should be installed on the boat, not based on consumption, but the panels themselves. Now, the question is hard panels or flexible panels? Of course, hard panels are significantly better because they have ventilation underneath and they do not degrade. If they are properly installed, they'll last indefinitely until they stop working physically or become obsolete. Soft panels are convenient, easier to handle, and you can lay them down. By the way, it's said that you shouldn't walk on them, but if you want to, you can. Stepping on them gently, nothing bad will happen. Therefore, if they are placed in areas where there is a chance you might step on them, then soft panels are fine. Due to the fact that flexible solar panels lie flat on the surface, they heat up significantly and consequently degrade much faster. Therefore, if we face the question of whether to use rigid panels or flexible, definitely use rigid ones. Consider flexible ones only when there's no other option, like in our case here. We need to climb up to fold the sail and if we install hard panels here we won't be able to access the hardtop anymore even now look i'm taking it i have to swallow 
the service is hot and there's not much sun right now. But this service is completely cool and these panels of the same size produce 430 watts, while those panels of the same size produce 550, meaning they are more efficient. Now, regarding the number of solar panels, we've covered that. We've also covered the number of consumers. Now, let's discuss the batteries. They are calculated a bit differently. Let's move to the next tab. I've prepared all this for you. So, let's take a look. We have lithium batteries on our boat. To ensure everything operates safely, if any cell, for example, fails, the BMS will shut down the entire setup and will be left without power. I'm not satisfied with that, so I divided the entire setup into two parts. That means I have two sections of 600 each. The setup is directly on the boat. If one fails, the second 600 works. In our daily consumption, this is when our boat operates in normal mode with some savings, meaning, roughly speaking, our toilets, water, refrigerator and other appliances are running. In this mode, our boat consumes 10 amps per hour, which totals 240 amp hours per day. This is essentially what we will draw from our batteries daily. I have previously shown you how I divided our battery assembly, the domestic batteries, into two parts for safety. If one half fails or one cell fails, the BMS disconnects it and we operate on the second half. I decided to set the Dolly energy consumption to be half of half the capacity basically 25% of the total available electricity or 50% of half in case something goes wrong with the batteries. If we take our daily consumption and multiply it by four, we get 960 ampere hours. That's essentially the energy we will consume over four days. Now regarding the batteries, the battery management system, BMS, shuts off the batteries at 10% remaining capacity to avoid damaging the cells. For safety, we consider this value to be 20%. In other words, if we have 1000 ampere hours, then we have 800 ampere hours available because 20% is considered our reserve, which we treat as zero. So there you go. If we add 20% to 960, we get 1,152 amp hours. This is the total battery capacity we need. So we round it up because such exact values don't exist is 1,200 ampere hours. That's what we need installed on our boat. Now let's see if there's a slight imbalance when the cells are installed. The cells will be disconnected by the battery management system, meaning we take 10% capacity, which the BMS considers as zero. And our remainder will be 1047 amp hours. In short, you understand. Let's summarize. We need 960 ampere hours at 20% and we get a total battery capacity of 1200 ampere hours. That's what we have installed on the boat. How many hours can the boat operate under normal load with the battery capacity we have here? 28 amps per hour equals 8 kilowatts per day, which we've simply divided over 24 hours. And so we have the result that in this mode, our boat can operate for 33 hours, which means roughly speaking, if we don't receive any energy and we just live our usual life, then we have enough for a full life for 33 hours. If we have 10 kilowatts, almost 11, then that's 24 hours. With 14 kilowatts, it's 19 hours. And if we have the most super efficient mode, we can live on these batteries for 115 hours. Hours, which I believe is an excellent result if we have problems and we, we can remain without recharging for quite a while. If we live in a normal mode where we have a regular charging cycle, we can also last quite a long time, more than a day, 33 hours. That's substantial when you have constant large sources of consumption. Large consumers drain a load from your batteries. So friends, now you know about the, what consumers we have, uh, how we can obtain this energy. 
and how much capacity do we need to make everything work? This is a comprehensive approach. Now let's consider another aspect. Where else can we get energy from? Have you seen the energy consumption of our boat? It is a very large amount. It is kilowatts per day, kilowatts per hour. So let's look at where we can get this amount of energy. The sun. Yes, we've sorted out solar energy. Do we have an alternator on the engine? A normal alternator can output somewhere around 80 amps per hour, but we can install a large alternator at 150, but we automatically enter the mode where we need to build a setup for it. That means installing a controller because it needs to be powered to avoid burning out. Then it must operate on special belts, so a lengthy some kind of kit. In short, we're talking about adding another $1,000 at a minimum to get this system to work, and then the alternator itself. So roughly speaking, we need to invest about $1,500 to get those services, like 150 amps instead of 80. Is it worth it? In my opinion, no, for another reason. The engine is an extremely important resource. Using it to charge the batteries is a severe misuse because when you enter or leave the marina, you need your engine to be in perfect condition with maximum resources. Therefore, we consider charging only in emergencies. Next, diesel generator. Here we will consider it very seriously because it's really an awesome device for charging. Now, let's calculate how much it costs you. Let's take a look at the generator set we have just to give you a clear idea of how it's set up. So, we have an Onan generator set with 6.5 kilowatts. Let's take a look. What are they made of? So, we can rely on 80% efficiency for this energy. Because if we use 6.5 kilowatts, I think our generator would die in a few hours. Therefore, we estimate that we cannot draw more than 80% of its energy. 6.5 kilowatts, 5,200 watts. This is precisely 80% of the energy that we can draw from it. This means it's that is the amount of energy we can plan for. So, in our case, on the boat, we have two Krasik chargers at 60 amps each. That's 120 amps or 1,440 watts. So almost one and a half kilowatts we, we use to charge our batteries. If you have one Krystek or another charger, that is 60 amps. For example, if it's 40 amps, then write down 60. This is 720 watts. In our case, we have two at 60, plus the Vectron inverter, which has a built-in charger at 120 amps. 4,440 watts that we draw from our generator, a total of 2.88 kilowatts we draw when charging the batteries and inverter. We are getting a current of 240 amps. This current can easily replenish the energy not acquired from the sun over a few hours if it has been cloudy for several days. In our case, there is still 2.3 kilowatts remaining. What can you use them for? For example, you can charge, turn on the washing machine and at the same time boil water meaning you have an optimal situation where you are charging boiling water and doing laundry, so your energy intake and consumption are balanced. I don't know, two liters of fuel per hour, and at the same time your batteries are charging as well, which is an optimal solution. Next, the wind generator. A wind generator is a very funny story because it produces very little energy. Well, maybe it produces about 10 amperes of current if the wind is blowing, say, at 30 knots. If it's blowing at a lower speed, it gives 2, 3, 5 amperes. Meanwhile, you have constant vibration, constant noise. To get so little energy, 
you need such an inconvenient device, so what can you gain from it? Power a light bulb at night? It's not even enough for a refrigerator, so what are we talking about? It's an absolutely unnecessary device on a boat. If you're somewhere with constant wind speeds of over 30, maybe it makes sense to install two of them, and it would be okay. But if you are in a situation like we are right now, with absolutely no wind, it is unusable. Water generator. A good thing, it provides about 15 amps at 6 knot speed, allowing you to recharge while sailing. When your speed is lower, you can switch to a larger propeller to make it work more efficiently. But we're talking about roughly 10 to 15 amperes that you can get from Watt and C, the most efficient water generator available at the moment. But you will have maintenance because there are many rotating parts underwater and water sometimes gets in. That's basically it. You automatically end up having to service this device. Moreover, the device costs around $5,000. It's an expensive device. We actually used to have one. We got rid of it because we found solar charging to be more efficient. Therefore, you can see that the most efficient way to generate energy when we lack sunlight is the diesel generator. So, uh, the genset that is installed on the boat, if you don't have one, then install more panels. If there's no space, then charge with the engine. In my view, other energy sources are inefficient, which is why we having had them before and with good operational experience, meaning I completed the circumnavigation with Watt and C and a wind generator, I decided that I don't need them on the boat in the future and I will not be using them. Therefore, I believe that solar panels and a genset are all you need to make your boat energy independent as well as water independent. This concludes this part and now let's go inside and I'll show you how it's all assembled and how it works. Well, let's take the Victron diagram since my entire system is based on Victron and I prefer Monobrand because they work very well with each other. On the diagram, it may look a little complicated, but remember, you're building a really cool system. The ecosystem inside your boat, so yes, you'll have to tinker a bit. Figure it out and set it up. But once you do it, everything will work just awesome. So delve into the Victron scheme and let's go. You will now see the basic Victron diagram. We don't use all the elements from this diagram, but most of them. And the principle is assembled just like it's drawn here. There are two communication systems between all the units. The first is VBUS, which is a connection via Ethernet, linking powerful devices that require a large number of command processing. And there is a second system called VDIRECT, which is simply information passing from unit to unit. And you can monitor information from, for example, MPPT controllers using VDIRECT. All of this is gathered by the CERBO, which is the unit located in the middle. So in the CERBO, we have, there are four units, four MPPT controllers, which transmit data about what they are currently receiving, indicating the amount of sunlight. And all this goes to the CERBO. Then there is a monitor that shows what's actually happening. It's full analytics. And you can program it because the system is quite flexible. We don't have control over a multi-computer. Plus, because all this operates through VBAS via the small screen that is part of the CERBOJBL, everything can be transmitted to software, a tablet or a phone, meaning you can receive data about what's happening on your boat over the internet, even if you're not on the boat, just by knowing the IP address and how to access it. Next, a large amount of data can be fed into the servo, such as fuel and water levels and temperature sensors. Various alarms, such as door alarm, bilge alarm, so you can input a lot of data here, information. 
And in case, for example, your bilge pump starts filling up, it will send data to the servo and it will beep and alert you. Also, there is a generator management unit. If, for example, your batteries are depleted, it can automatically start the generator. There are various setups like consumption delays and so on. Overall, the system, awesome. I really like it. And the inverter, which is also connected to the turbo, manages everything. The shunt analyzes all the data on energy input and output and also transmits the data to the servo. You can see how cool this system from Victron is. Sure, here is a translation. So uh, the very first and most important thing is energy monitoring. That's why we have a device called Servo and a screen that displays a lot of information. But I'll tell you a little more about it. Uh, let's see what it can do. On the main screen, there are our batteries are shown here along with the amount of energy they receive the solar panels are part of the dc system indicating how much energy the bot is receiving or consuming a c e 220 volts que opera através do inverter you can access each device to illustrate we can turn off the inverter use it as a charger only or utilize it solely as an inverter. So besides monitoring, this system also allows for control. You can explore each section and see what functions they offer. Also displayed here on the screen are the diesel tanks, showing the fuel we have and the water in our tanks. All of this connects to the Cerebo, providing a really cool monitoring of all the onboard systems. If you enter the menu, we now enter a vast array of parameters, all adjustable, and there are even scripts you can run, for example, based on the amount of energy configure it to 10% or 20%, the generator will automatically start charging either based on time or reaching a certain percentage and then the batteries will disconnect. Meaning this is a really cool system that can there, sending alarms there. In general, it's a super system that allows you to fully manage all the systems on your boat. This also includes the MP, EPT controllers and everything related to the tanks and other components. Fuel and everything else, it's automatically connected to the internet and it can update itself. It's a very cool system with very powerful data analysis. All right, folks, I'm not going to show you in detail how everything is assembled with each bolt. That's not important in this case. There are rules for assembling various electrical systems. You need to know this if you're starting to use it yourself. You need to understand how everything is put together, what bus bars, what washers are used. You'll have to figure this out on your own. My, I might talk about this in some videos later, but right now the main goal is to understand how the system is structured without getting into the small details. So let's just see how it's put together. Let's now talk about the batteries, specifically the setup I have on my boat. I consider this setup optimal as it is a super safe solution that in the event of a failure in one of the cells won't cause a blackout on the boat allowing you to continue functioning fully. What you see on the screen now, the battery assembly is divided into two parts, upper and lower. I'll talk about this a bit later, but let's discuss the batteries. By the way, we previously had an episode about these batteries. I showed how to assemble them. Check the link if you missed that video. We assembled this system using 3.2 volt cells. Our uh, assembly is uh, divided into two parts, an upper and a lower section, each of 600 ampere hours. Each half consists of four sets of three cells 
of 3.2 volts each. Each negative wire has a separate battery management system. There is a separate system that indicates the operation of the battery management system in case of imbalance. It will disconnect a module. All this is connected through bus bars, positive and negative separately. Balancers are connected to each module. The biggest problem with lithium is imbalance. Right now, things are a bit messy since I've been maintaining the system, but usually the wires are all nicely arranged. I've made a small diagram to show how my system is assembled. So on the left, we have four solar panels. I connected each solar panel to an MPPT controller individually. Next, there are switches that can cut off the energy supply if something goes wrong with any of the solar panels. Next, all of this passes through the BMS and goes into the batteries. And after the batteries, the load is applied. We have two systems. This is DC direct current, which actually powers our boat. And uh, AC is the alternating current that goes through the inverter. The inverter also acts as a charger, allowing you to charge lithium very efficiently if you have shore power available. It's clear from the diagram. Moving on, I have four MPPT controllers separately displayed that send all data to the Xerbo. I can monitor each individual battery and understand how much energy each battery is providing. This is all connected through switches, as I mentioned to you. You can individually disconnect each solar panel, then there is a large switch that disconnects the Victron inverter and everything high voltage with heavy currents is routed through a special bus bar with large fuses rated at 200 and 500 amperes. So in this case, if something goes wrong, the high currents won't cause any major issues. The fuses will simply blow and that's it. Now let's take a look at the Victron itself. The instructions say that it should be placed in a well-ventilated area, but in this case, we decided to do it differently. I placed it in a compartment where we previously had starter batteries. There wasn't much space, so we needed to ensure circulation. Therefore, we set up forced ventilation at the back of the inverter using a corrugated hose and a large blower, meaning engine room ventilation. Such blowers are used. We have a 12 volt blower that creates a strong airflow and circulates all the hot air from the inverter outside where it can be easily drawn from where it naturally exits. To achieve this, the Victron is connected via Ethernet to a computer. And uh, the program Abram, can be set to activate a relay and that relay controls this blower. Thus, Victron follows this logic. For instance, when there's a heavy load, the cooling fan turns on, passing air through the unit. After 10 seconds of the fan being turned on, the relay is activated was according to the logic, which starts the blower to dissipate heat. Once the relay turns off, after cooling down, when the heat was expelled from the inverter within 30 seconds and the blower continues to run, then it shuts off after 30 seconds. So that's our system, which allows for heat dissipation. The unit itself is, is not located in the most convenient spot on the boat, but we've managed the heat dissipation in this simple way through a programmer using Victron software by configuring the relay on the inverter. Well, folks, this episode has come to an end. I hope this complex and tedious information was useful for you. For Yachtsman, I think it's super useful because with this, from this video, you can assemble the whole system yourself. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It's very important. More subscribers, more motivation to film something cool. Like, comment. I think there's something to discuss here. 
See you in the next episode. Bye.